wilds of Alaska abound with beauty, timelessness, and endless dangers. For more than two decades, Billy Moles has led big game hunting expeditions into the last frontier's most isolated, unspoiled, and merciless lands. Oh, I'm happy for you. More than eight years of his life have been lived in a tent in the wilderness. An adventurer, author, and filmmaker, Billy considers himself, first and foremost, a student of nature. His brushes with death. Adversities overcome. This is every guide's nightmare. It's coming true. And countless lessons learned studying the day-to-day -day existence of the wildlife and the peaceful balance of this savage land have molded him into one of today's most dynamic, captivating public speakers and master storytellers. Every face I see is turned to Billy Bowles, and they are in trance. Just like the Alaskan wilderness, no one leaves a Billy Moles presentation the same person as they enter it. Let the adventure begin. So I currently guide for dull sheep, caribou, moose, brown bear, and grizzly bear. But who I am, my brand if you will, I would say it's all about the experience of being immersed in the wilderness. That's what I love about my job. Above all else, I consider myself to be a student of nature. And for the record, I also have a college education. It was the worst three weeks of my life. <laughs> Wasn't for me. But over the past 21 years, I'd like to think that I've got a PhD in wilderness adventure. I dare say most of who I am and the most valuable lessons that I've learned in my life have come from the results of my experiences in the wilds of Alaska. Now the steps and skills required to lead a successful hunting expedition into the Alaskan wilderness are the same steps that it takes to become successful in any job, any business, raising a family, or any facet in life, or attaining any goal. So 100 days out of the year, I lead one to three hunters into the Alaskan wilderness, where 911 is at a minimum days away, maybe weeks away. Now perhaps the greatest leader in all of nature is the alpha wolf. He's disciplined, cunning, and he's ruthless. He's arguably the greatest hunter in North America. So naturally, as a hunting guide, as a hunter, I'm gonna study him every chance that I can. But the universal characteristic of the alpha wolf and every great leader known to man in the history of time is this. Every decision he makes is for the well-being of the pack. So as soon as they spot a rival pack or a moose that they wanna kill and eat, where does the leader go? He assumes position, he goes right to the front and he leads, he assumes the responsibility, he takes on the risk. I saw this exact scenario take place uh, just a couple of years ago uh, when I was moose hunting with a couple of brothers. We were moose and grizzly bear hunting. Glassed up on this ridge two miles away and I see all these animals and I think, man, is that a herd of caribou? And I glass up there, it was wolves, a pack of 13. You very rarely see that many. In this area, there's so many wolves, they're, they're rampant, you don't even need a tag. And there's no limit. And so I howled like a wolf, but they couldn't hear me. And we're moose hunting, so then I just figure, well, I'll try a cow call. So I go like this. So that vibratory tone, they heard that. And they all started howling. My hunters are like, holy smokes, you think they're gonna come? I said, well, maybe. I've called wolves in before, but typically they don't. They're very, very smart. 
But the thing is, is that a big pack like that, they're very, very confident. Calling in a lone wolf is very difficult. So I waited a minute, got my hunters all ready, and I ripped out another call, and all of a sudden, bam, here they come. So about eight of them, they just lined out single file. The other five, they just went to either flank, um, and, and they started coming in through the brush. What are the wolves in the back? Who are they watching? They're focusing on their leader. They're watching everything that he does. And so as they get closer, they eventually kind of break apart and fan out, but the alpha is still leading the charge. And because their leader never flinches as he heads into battle, the rest of the pack has absolute confidence that they can handle whatever is about to come. So at the moment of attack, all the other wolves then step up side by side with their leader, risk their lives, and go for the kill. So in my mind, there's two trademark qualities that a wolf pack must have to survive. So here's a copy of my latest DVD to whoever can tell me one of those qualities. I'm looking for two. What, what does it take for a wolf pack to survive in the Alaskan wilderness? Two things that I'm looking for. Teamwork, that's one. I heard the other one. Who said leadership? All right, that guy can't get that computer going, but he knows a lot about leadership. So. <laughs> And so here's the thing with, with nature. Everything has a purpose. Everything happens for a reason. Now this 40 pound weasel is the toughest big game animal in all of Alaska to shoot because they never stop moving. They have exceptional strength. If these things grew to be a thousand pounds, man would be extinct. These things are killing machines. A 40 pound weasel can kill a 2000 pound bull moose. How does he do that? In the winter time, the snow gets deep and it can get 80 below zero. So that wolverine, that, that snow is deep, the moose has a very hard time getting around in that deep snow, and so he just doesn't want to move because he's going to expend more energy than he can possibly find trying to feed. So he just tries to save his energy and he just lays there. That wolverine, if you can get a little bit of a crust on the snow, he will sneak up on that moose, jump on the back, on his back. We got any wrestlers here? He's basically... Dan Gable times a million, right? And he just gets on their back, bites into the back of their neck, and that bull moose tries to thrash him off until finally he's exhausted. That wolverine's so strong, the bull's never gonna shed him off. Then the wolverine basically starts to eat the moose alive. Now eventually that bull will die, it might take several days, but now he's got 1,800 to 2,000 pounds of meat laying there. Well, here's the thing with wolverines, they don't hibernate like a bear their back molars grow 90 degrees to the rest of their teeth. That allows them to shred frozen flesh and break bone. So he can literally survive on that one bull moose all winter long. Everything in nature has a purpose 100% of the time. He touches down just a little too soon and he hits one of those big snow drifts and boom, flop. The airplane goes end over end. First words out of his mouth, I'm sorry guys. We're gonna get you out of here today. Like, dude, you just crashed your airplane. <laughs> I'm not worried about getting out of here today. Looked past everything that had gone wrong and he focused solely on what needed to be done and he put a plan into action and the rest of us responded. And under his leadership, we responded like a wolf pack. We stepped up alongside him and did whatever needed to, to get done to get out of that situation. Well, then I started laughing. We both knew the kind of situation that we were in. And he's like, all right, how do you want to handle this? I said, well, I figure I'll go on point. I'll take the blood. You watch my flank. Plan sounds great, except one thing. He said, I'm going first. And I was like, no, John, this is my mess. I'm going first. What he's talking about is whoever is going to be taking the blood, he's going to be doing this all the time. His head's going to be down. He's going to be leading. Most likely, he's going to be the first one that the bear comes to kill. The guy in back, while that job isn't as dangerous, it is more critical because it's his job to kill the bear before it gets to the guy in front. And I said, no, I'm taking the lead, John. And John said, Billy, you've got a wife and three kids. I got nobody. If I die to here today, nobody's really going to miss me. He said, if, if something happens to you and I could have done something to prevent it, I couldn't live with myself. I argued with John, but after a while I realized that dude's been in 200 fist fights. John, let's do it your way. <laughs> so we could smell the bear. We had pretty good blood. Everybody asked, oh man, that's gotta be an adrenaline rush. That is 100% the complete opposite of what the feeling is. I dare say stalking a wounded bear, I've done it several times, and it's 
pretty much always been the same. I've never gotten buck fever, um, sneaking up on a bear, stalking, tracking a wounded bear, anything like that. It goes far beyond that. It's probably the most peaceful thing I've ever done in my whole entire life. You are so focused on the job at hand, the rest of the world ceases to exist. It is you, those that you're with, and the bear, and any information or clue that nature will give you to help you kill the bear before it kills you. You're listening for a bird to chirp, uh, a squirrel to chirp, a twig to crack, anything like that. John parts the brush just to kind of step through and all of a sudden, roar, here comes the bear. John steps, he's coming, he steps up, I step right alongside of him, and John's just sitting there waiting, and we can hear the brush, we can hear the bear growl, growling, but we can't see anything. And we know it's coming right at us, and eventually I can clearly see the brush being mowed down in front, and as the bear's running at us, I can see the brush flipping back up, kind of like an ice fisherman's tip up, right? And so I know the bear's in there, John's right here, and the bear's coming right at us. I've got four rounds in my 375, John's got a 458 lot, which is just short of a cannon. And uh, so he's basically waiting for the bear to come right off of his muzzle. And so boom, I, I know where the bear has got to be. I can't see it. Boom, I shoot. Boom, 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 boom. Just then, the first time we actually see the bear, I only had one round left in my gun. It was from me to that chair away. Boom, one last shot and the bear was dead. And then Mitch goes, holy smokes, that was intense. He's like, pulls up, gets his video camera back running. When he was filming, he f dropped the video camera and slapped shut so he didn't get any of it on, on film. I had my GoPro on, there's some pretty good footage on that. But he's like, all right, you guys, hold your hands out for the camera. So John and I are side by side. We both hold our hands out and they're both stone still. And he's like, I don't know whether to be impressed or nervous by the fact that your guys' hands are stone still. We both looked at each other, probably a little bit of both. <laughs> and so the 40 plus years that, of bear hunting experience that John and I brought into the bush that day, I dare say was equally as valuable to us and to Mitch as our rifles were. Not only did both of us prophesy exactly what that bear was gonna do and exactly what was gonna happen, not that we know everything about bear hunting, but we knew basically what would likely happen. But he and I had faced so many adversities and gotten ourselves out of so many adversities over the years that we, we had total confidence going into that scenario that we could handle it. We worked as a team and we got the job done. And I know Mitch certainly appreciated as he uh, recognized that, you know, had we not had the experience that we had, it was very likely it wouldn't have gone nearly as well. The skills you learn as you overcome adversity in any aspect of life, those are feathers in your cap. Those are tools in your toolbox. As you learn more about your craft, develop teamwork and leadership, you'll become more valuable. More valuable to your customers, more valuable to your company. I'm more interested in the environment because I know the healthiest, oldest animals are going to live in the best areas. The strongest ecosystems always have the biggest bears. So we all hear the term balance of nature. This is how nature works. Nature is constantly balancing itself by the giving and receiving of energy or life from one organism to the other. Perhaps the best example is a salmon. So a salmon is born in a river, it stays there for a year, just like a little creek like this will be laced with salmon all summer long. The salmon is born, stays in the river for a year, swims out into the Pacific Ocean, swims for thousands and thousands of miles for two to seven years depending on the species. Eventually nature takes over and no scientist can figure out how or why, but that salmon will come back to the stream of its birth. As soon as it swims upstream into fresh water, it starts to die, it quits eating. So some salmon will swim over 2,000 miles up the Yukon River without eating. They will go to the place of their birth, they will spawn, and they will die. That's why they're so fat in all the omega oils and the protein, because they need that to sustain them for that long journey to where they spawn. So this whole time as those salmon, they're going up, they're, it's a kamikaze mission, none of them are going to survive. As, the, as they're going up these streams, bears are constantly, all summer long, they're, they're grabbing these fish and they're eating them. And so a bear, he's going to come into the stream, 
grab a fish, bring it up on the bank. He's going to bite into it. During the peak of the salmon run, this is what he's going to do. When fish are everywhere, he's going to bite it at the tail, rip the flesh off the fish. He's going to eat the flesh. He's going to eat the eggs if it's a female, 2,000 to 7,000 eggs. He'll eat all those eggs, bite into the head, suck the brains out of the fish, and leave the actual flesh of the fish laying there. Why is he doing that? Any guesses? Yes. If you've ever been so hungry, I've been at, done it many times sheep hunting, you get so hungry you don't cheer, uh, crave a cheeseburger or pizza. You either want sugar, fat, protein, salt, water. You get on that basic uh, elemental level, and that's what those bears understand. He, it's like mashed potatoes and gravy, skip the mashed potatoes. He's just eating the gravy. His job in life is to get as big and as strong as he can, and that's what he's going to do every time. And so meanwhile, what's left is all these salmon are going to be on the banks. Now smaller bears, fox, eagles, wolves, um, something's, going to something's going to clean up everything that's left. What doesn't get eaten, where does it go? It goes down into the soil, which fertilizes the alders and the willows along the riverbanks. Not only does that feed the moose, the ptarmigan, and everything else, but it also prevents the erosion in the stream, which keeps the rivers safe and secure which the salmon need to go up and spawn every year. So that's a, it, it basically, it's a, a complete cycle of the salmon's life. So nature really isn't a chain, it's more like a spider web. If one little strand breaks or is disrupted, the integrity of the whole web is compromised. The alder bush that grows along the side of the river, how high will it grow? How deep will it send its roots? Without fail, it's going to grow as tall as it can. It's going to send its roots as deep as it can every single time. And that's the case with everything in nature. A spawning salmon, it faces adversity. Two, only two out of 2,000 to 7,000 eggs will actually successfully reproduce. The brown bear, does he stop eating once his tummy's full? Absolutely not. A brown bear, his whole life, he spends growing as big and strong as he can possibly be and pass along his genetics. That's what he does without fail. That's his purpose in life. Everything in nature strives to maximize its potential. Nothing in nature ever quits. Why is that? Everything in nature strives ceaselessly to grow. Here's why. Whether you're an alder bush, a robin, or a human, this is firmly what I believe, is because growth is the essence of life. If nature fails to grow, Nature ceases to exist. This is how nature works. An organism is given life, and then it's given whatever it needs to sustain that life, and then it grows. And as it grows, it gives something back to nature. As it grows and gives more, it receives more. The growth of that organism becomes exponential. The growth of that organism is what fuels the ecosystem that it lives in. Strong ecosystems are developed only when each organism performs its function and its purpose. Your ecosystem, at least professionally, is right here, Stob Construction. And all of you have the ability to make it as strong and as healthy as you want to make it. To maximize the growth and potential of Stob Construction, all of you collectively must perform your jobs to the best of your ability. And when you do that, your company will thrive and grow. And guess what? As your company grows, you will thrive and grow. So my challenge to you today is this, is to grow to your maximum potential, to work together as a team, to step up and lead when called upon, and to train those who are with you. Train those beneath you the way you wish you had been trained. And as you come, overcome adversity, learn from it. And mark my words, if everyone in here does that today, this company will thrive. In five years, when I come back to talk to you again, I'll have that cord that I need. And <laughs> but there will be 200 of you here. And many of you will be the leaders, the supervisors, the managers. In five years, all of you will be reaping a harvest. I've seen a lot of big trucks here. In five years, you guys are going to be driving better Harleys. You're going to have bigger mud tires. All you gearheads are going to have bigger tires on your truck. The family men will be sending your children to better schools. 
Instead of weekend getaways to the Holiday Inn, all you bachelors will be taking your lady friends to Tahiti. And perhaps one day you hunters will be calling on me to go on your own Alaskan adventure. Maybe not. <laughs> but your growth and the growth of Stob Construction starts today. It starts right here, it starts right now, and it starts with you. God bless you all. He talked about the hunting, he talked about the challenges of, of the outdoor, and uh, I think it really hit home. And every face I see is turned to Billy Bowles, and they are entranced. The inspirational, the motivation, the message you have is so cool. Billy has been a great asset in delivering his message. He's got you all the way to the end, and then he hits it home. It said, adventure begins when things go wrong. Well, adventure's my business. I spend 100 days each year in the Alaskan wilderness, and it's inevitable that things are gonna go wrong. And that's just like life, and it's just like business. So whether you're an Alaskan hunting guide, or, or you're in any situation or facet in life or business, those who solve the most problems and overcome the most adversities, those are the ones who succeed. In my presentations, I use the laws and principles of nature and use stories to demonstrate how I get my clients and I out of these seemingly, sometimes potentially life or death situations. No matter your business, no matter your industry, whatever message or takeaway you're looking for, whether it's leadership, safety, teamwork, I guarantee you I can relate it to the wilderness and nature and it will be a message unlike any your attendees have ever heard, and I guarantee it won't be one they'll soon forget.